Okay. So today we will start with a statistical data analysis. And with any kind of data analysis, of course, you start with collecting your data. And the first important thing there is sampling, that you have to choose what data you want to collect. So there are some uh, formal terms, but it's just a formalization what all of us as scientists do in whatever field of research we are, even across humanities and uh, and maybe geography, anything that everything involves data, right? Any form of research. But the terms you will see they are relate uh, the they are more directly related with the types of research that require a survey of people or surveys of data from various users. So the terminology is sort of geared to that. But if you think of it in terms of your own field, you, you can always find an analogy in most cases. So I will try to draw that link throughout the lecture today. But the terms are still related to, you know, a sample of people and population and uh, and them answering questions, etc. So the first um, thing is that you have a population, which means you have the system that you want to study. In case of people, it, you can maybe choose people in India. That may be the population you want to study. In case of a simulation, you might want to study how a protein folds over a time of uh, 10 microseconds. So all the configurations of the protein in that time period will be your population. Or if it's uh, some sort of spectra, it may be the uh, all the points where you record your data at various frequencies. That may be your population. If you do this at various temperatures, then that whole set of data will be your population. Then from that, uh, you want to do an analysis on a sample. So normally the sample size is dictated by the limits to the uh, calculations that you want to do, the analysis that you want to do. Or it is related to the number of reliable data points you have. Uh, so those are the two main limiting factors for your sample size. Ideally, of course, it would be best if you could take the whole population in your sample, but that is typically not possible. And in between, you see, we have also something called a sampling frame. So a sampling frame is basically the recorded data. So even if you are dealing with the population of India, you cannot, let's say, talk to every person in India. Uh, or, or, or even the fact that the, all the people in India are not listed anywhere. So the list that you have of people, that would be your sampling frame. In case of, say, a molecular simulation, the time points at which you save your data, that will give you a sampling frame. So that is the re recorded data that you have. And from this recorded data, you can choose your sample, depending on what sort of analysis you want to do. So let's uh, look at a molecular simulation in a bit more detail. So let's say you have a simulation which you run for, uh, for 10,000 seconds. So I'm just using very large uh, numbers for ease of understanding. Typically, you would run something uh, uh, for maybe a microsecond at most. A molecular simulation typically runs about a microsecond. Okay. So, but anyhow, let's say, let's say I run something for 10,000 seconds. Okay. Then my population is every moment. So every infinitely small moment in that time is my population. But I cannot, uh, but my, my, my numerical procedure itself involves discretizing this time. So I have finite time intervals. So let's say I am 
uh, I have, have a time step of one second, which means I do 10,000 calculations in simulation. If I saved the positions of the particles and the when their velocities at every second, at every time step, my uh, hard disk would be full. I cannot do that. So let's say I take every 100 seconds. If I do every 100 seconds, I get 100 files. And these hundred files. Excuse me, ma'am. My sampling frame. Yeah. Uh, ma'am, are you trying to present something like? Uh, I think your slides are still stuck in the sampling and probability sampling. Those slides. Uh, so. Uh, no, no, I have. I don't have any uh, pictures. So it's. Oh, is it okay. moving now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. have not moved the slide. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> no, no problem. Okay, maybe I can draw something that makes it easier. So in a simulation, let's say you're generating something like this, an energy versus time plot for some system. Okay. And then you have many, many points, which is so every moment is a uh, constitutes a population. Then the files that you save, let's say every 100 seconds, that gives you the sampling frame. And from this, you choose your sample. So how to choose the sample, we will uh, come to a little bit later. So, and okay, and before we go any further, uh, you will encounter the term sampling bias, which basically means that some members of a population may be systematically more likely to be selected in a sample than others. This uh, may or may not occur in your case, so it depends. So in case of scientific data, sampling bias is somewhat unlikely, but not impossible. So for example, um, you may think that the most important part of your simulation or the most important uh, fold that is occurring, let's say, in a protein occurs at some, uh, between a certain time interval, and you might save more files in that region. But that, that is because you expect something to happen there. Okay, so that is a sampling bias. Uh, but if you, but let's say your hunch is wrong, then you may be missing something in some very unimportant section, what you think to be unimportant. So sampling bias is a part of every every uh, scientific endeavor. It's of course more likely when you're doing surveys, etc. But even in science, it can happen. And different types of sampling have different amounts of sampling bias inherently. So there are two basic types of sampling. One is probability sampling and the other is non-probability sampling. Now under probability sampling, since uh, it is a more or less random sort of sampling or a well-defined uh, random sampling, we will see why I write, why I include well-defined random sampling, then the good thing about it is that statistical inference is possible, which means that the laws of statistics, which, which assume random distributions, uh, they, will, they will be largely obeyed by your uh, data set. On the other hand, a non-probability sampling is more subjective uh, because there is a criteria in which you select the data in the first place. So the sampling bias is very, very high in that case already. Okay, So a non-probability sampling is more useful when you want to answer a particular question that you have in mind and you choose your sample accordingly. If you just want to know what is happening in general, then a non-probability sampling is, uh, is not the right way to go. So let's look at the subcategories now. So in probability sampling, you have uh, roughly four types. So one is a simple random sample. So from the recorded data that you have, that is the sample frame or the sampling frame, you 
just randomly select a certain number of data points according to your sample size. Okay, so there is no criteria even for uniformity of any kind. So actually, if unless your data is ordered in some way, uh, the concept of uniformity does not arise. Okay. However, in our example of a simulation, your data will be inherently ordered. It will be ordered in time. So there, a simple random sample is probably not a good idea. So there you go for a So there you go for what normally what people do is to go for a systematic sim, uh, sample. For a systematic sample, that is the most common type of sampling in science. So this is basically a equispaced sample in a way. So if you have some sort of inherent ordering, whether it is time or frequency or temperature or whatever, then you take equispaced points, which is a systematic sample. However, uh, not, not systematic sampling is not always good. So then you have to do, go for stratified sampling. So when is systematic sampling not good? So there may be an unimportant part of your plot and an important part of your plot. Like I said, so you may anticipate that between two time points, the most important thing is happening. You might want to sample that more uh, regularly or more frequently. So in that case, you do a stratified sample. You split up your data points into some subsets based on some criteria and within that subset you do a random sampling or you could even do a systematic sample in the subgroups. Then the other thing is the cluster sampling. Now cluster sampling is when you already have some sort of uh, natural clusters okay, of data and you select whole clusters. So it's, well, natural clustering meaning, uh, uh, what sort of example can there be? So in case of populations, you might, um, so let's say you want to do a survey on the population of something, let's say age distribution or some blood group distribution or something, and you, and you know, and, we, and populations are typically uh, clustered into towns and cities. Okay. So just selecting the towns randomly is good enough. And you assume that the clusters are more or less similar so that sampling uh, 10 towns from out of 100 towns gives you a rough idea of every town. So that is a class that is cluster sampling. Okay. So this might even hold when you have uh, simulations on me uh, myself. So I, I don't do molecular simulations myself. So the analogies may not be perfect. So so let's say you're doing simulations on my cells and you just want to know what goes on inside uh, inside a my cell. Then you just select maybe ten my cells in various parts of your system. Okay. And then you uh, look at the uh, at the dynamics that's happening inside the mice. So you have a natural clustering and you look inside it. And then what is non-probability sampling? So what are the types of non-probability sampling? There is the convenience sampling, which means you take uh, a sample that is convenient for you. Okay. So let's say you want to do a survey on how online teaching is working and you're a student advisor Kolkata, it would be most convenient for you to do a survey inside Iser Kolkata. And it is not an unreasonable assumption that this uh, survey will reflect the situation in the various ISERs and IITs at least. So they, it may be very different in state universities or uh, rural colleges or something, but you can at least say that your 
uh, your survey will be representative of the various ISAs and IITs, let's say. So that is a convenient sample, but it may work in many cases. And then there is the voluntary response sample. Uh, here, the, again, the sample bias is relatively high because it, de uh, it depends on the question you're asking, of course. So if your survey involves uh, online teaching, taking our previous example, and you're doing an online survey, it is likely that you will get a good sample because the people are already connected. On the other hand, if you want to study, let's say, the health of rural women and you take a voluntary response sample, you will have a very, very biased sample. Only a few well-connected individuals will respond to your survey. Okay. Uh, or if you're doing a survey of uh, CEOs, you can imagine what a small number would respond. Okay? So in that case, a voluntary response sample may not be the way to go. In science, uh, of course, uh, we have passive data. So this is not such a, so this is not such a important uh, sampling anyway. Okay? The other one is the quota sample. So a quota sample is where you want to have representations from various groups in a population. So in case of a survey like thing, uh, let's say you want to have uh, a proportion of women in your sampling, which represents the proportion of women in the population. Okay, that may be an uh, important criteria for you. And you can do a quota sampling. Uh, in case of scientific data, also you can have quotas in the sense of uh, if you're if you're building something in the UV range, okay, then you might want to study data points in the UV range, which is proportional to the amount of UV in sunlight. So this is just a random example. So, so that's also possible. So it's similar to a stratified sample but uh, it is a more stringent criteria in the sense you're selecting the subgroups to represent some proportion. In case of stratified sampling, you're just dividing into groups from the, from the data that you have, okay, based on this criteria. But here you're making sure that the proportion is representative of some larger population. That is the quota sampling. Then there is the judgmental sample or purposive sample. So that is, so what can be an example? Uh, so you're, so here you're hand picking every uh, data point, okay? So in case of people, uh, you might want to so you might know a certain number of people and you might have an opinion that they are unbiased in some way. Uh, let's, let's say you know who is unbiased and who is not with respect to political opinion maybe. And you only talk to people who you know are unbiased and you take a survey from them. That is one way of going. Uh, in case of data, it can be that you are aware of which sort of data is most reliable from which instrument. So let's say many, many people have collected data at, in various places with various instruments. You pick out, uh, let's say you take temperature data from the instruments you trust. You take, um, I don't know, density data from instruments you, uh, you trust. So you, you handpick your data depending on your knowledge and experience. So that is a judgmental sample. And what is a snowball sample? So a snowball sample is where you let the samples decide the sample points. So you pick a few sample points and you let these sample points decide what more the, decide what other sample points will get included. Uh, in case of surveys, this is of course simply telling your candidate to look for other people who are willing to answer your questions. In case of scientific uh, data, it may be that if 
a data point fits a certain criteria or it gives a particularly useful uh, result, you choose other data points of, the, of a similar kind. Okay, so you follow more useful paths. So that would be a snowball sample. And these are not watertight boxes. So you can combine the various types of sampling methods depending on what you need. So the most important questions to ask before you start collecting the data. So it is to define the aim of your research. So what is the aim of your research? Do you simply want to explore what is happening? So you don't have any guess or you don't have any expectation. Uh, do you want to calculate something? So if you want to calculate something, that would be quantitative. If you want to add, find out trends in the data, that would be qualitative. Or if you have a hypothesis, so you already have a theory or an idea about what should happen, and you want to see if it fits. So in all these three cases, your approach will be slightly different. So if you want to do a quantitative analysis, you have to have a clear idea about how you will calculate the quantities that you want. In that case, uh, for example, you might want to record your data in a certain way. So that come, brings you to data requirements. Okay. So depending on what you want to calculate, you have to collect your data. So let's say, uh, and this is of course related to the methods to be used for analysis. Uh, in my case, I can tell you in any sort of computational uh, research, you might want to analyze some, analyze your system through a certain software. Okay, this is an existing software, and that probably give, and that you know will give you what you want. Now this. You have to be clear about what input files or what file formats, for example, that this software accepts. And when you're running your simulation or running your quantum chemical computation, you must generate your files in that format. So you have to think ahead and know exactly what you will do before you collect your data. Okay? So if you don't do that, so this is something that I have learned the hard way. You can run your computation and you have generated all your data, but simply your data is in the wrong format. Okay. And then the software that would be most convenient cannot read this, this, these files. So then you have two ways to go. You can either waste a lot of human effort writing some code which will convert this file format to what is required. Uh, this is so these file formats are normally not. Uh, things for which you get online converters. So you would have to do it yourself and it's not an easy job. The second way to go would be to rerun your computation and generate the required files, which would be a huge waste of computational time and money. Okay. So just thinking ahead before you start doing your work would save you this uh, problem at the end. And I guess it's even more important for experiments because your chemicals are expensive. So once you run some experiment and you realize you didn't record something important, which would have been needed, which would be needed for the calculation that you want to do, uh, you'd have to redo your experiment, which of course is again, time and money consuming. So it's, Good to be clear about what you want to calculate and what will go into it. On the other hand, if you're doing a qualitative analysis, okay, so if you just want to find out trends, then if you are roughly, if you're not, if you don't have any exact aim in mind, uh, then of course you cannot uh, take the same precautions that you would do if you were doing a qu quantitative. Uh, analysis. So then you would have to collect your data and then look at it and figure out trends. 
And then the third one is when you want to test your hypothesis. This is similar to maybe a quantitative uh, analysis, but it's even more structured because you already know exactly the question you want to answer and you even know the answer. It's not just the question. So you can gear your uh, data collection to, to that. Then the third point is to choose your data collection method. Now, this is more subjective for humanities or people doing surveys. I don't know, on animal populations or something. But for most scientific experiments or theoretical uh, research, the data collection method is more or less well defined. It's something you know already. And it's also limited. You don't have a wide variety of ways in which you collect your data. So you would have to, uh, so it's more the type of information that you will record during the data collection in case of our scientific research. Okay. But if it was a humanities research, you see you can have a survey, an interview, uh, it can be an ethnography or observation or archival research or Archival research is just looking into data in libraries or secondary data collection, taking data from other people and um, and sort of assimilate, what is it called, aggregating them and then doing your analysis. So there, there is a lot of subjectivity and what works best for you, etc. Okay. Then comes four, plan your data collection procedures. So there are, so in case of surveys, there is again more work to be done here because you have to figure out the questions you will ask and ensure there are no gaps in logic or that you're covering all the, all the topics that you want to cover, etc. In our case, it's mainly the variables you will record. Uh, you should also think about what cross checks are possible for your data. So, for example, let's say you record a spectra of some kind, okay? And then some part of the spectra is unusual, and you don't understand what is happening there. If, and when you're looking at it, you think, okay, if I only knew if this, uh, how this peak changed with temperature, I would be able to guess at what is happening in my chemical system. But you don't have that data. And let's say you this was some long drawn experiment, so you can't redo it immediately. So in that case, if you had already thought about possible cross checks before, uh, you could have done a temperature variation uh, spectra in the first place. Okay. So it's good to think about it a little and see if doing a little more work at the initial phase helps you later to verify your uh, data and understand what is happening. If you're doing an experiment that is part of planning your experiment, of course, then you might be using data from satellites and sensors. So it is a good thing to choose uh, what sort of sensors, uh, what sort of data from sensors you want and or satellites, I guess, because it also involves administration where you have to write to people to get this data. So, so planning is important. Then, of course, comes collecting the data. Now, this is much easier for people doing surveys. They just have to go ahead and collect the answers to the questions they've planned. Uh, in case of experimentalists and uh, computational people, chemists and physicists and biologists, this is a very, this is probably the most important step to collect the data properly. So you have to do the experiment carefully, make sure your errors are minimized or that there are no uh, contaminants or whatever. So depending on the type of experiment that you're doing. Okay. So this is very important for us in science. And once you have collected your data, you come to the main part, which is the data analysis. So by definition, it is a process of inspecting, 
cleansing, transforming, and modeling data with the goal of discovering useful information, informing conclusions, and supporting decision making. Okay, so once you have the data, you will have to look at it, uh, figure out if some data points are wrong. You have to change it to transforming means converting it to a form which is analyzable or a form or, or visualizing it. We will talk about data visualization as well. And then modeling data that is explaining what the data is showing. Okay. That is broadly data analysis. Uh, another term which has come into play, and you've been hearing it a lot, big data and data mining with all the, the or if, if with everything going online, this has become a very major field of activity. So data mining is basically data analysis for predictive purpose rather than descriptive or understanding purpose. So if you look at data solely for the reason of uh, understanding how people think or what is going on in a chemical system, then it is data analysis. So it is particularly called mining when you use the information of trends in the data to predict what a certain group of people or even individuals will do. So when you do the prediction part, it is called data mining. So it's the intelligence algorithms that uh, Facebook uses, for example, to show you tailored ads or relevant ads, as they call it. Okay. So they're predicting what you might want to buy or what video you want, might want to see on YouTube, for example. So that is data mining. It's using the data from your history to predict what you might want to do. Okay. Then roughly there are three steps to data analysis. So we are not going into data mining. That is just an additional step. So initially you have to do data analysis. So the first step is data processing, which is structuring your data so that it is easily analyzable. You might want to convert a non-numeric data to numeric data. So a yes and no may be converted to maybe one and zero. And then you can apply statistical formulae to it, for example. Then data cleaning. You have to have some mechanism for identifying incomplete, duplicate, or erroneous data. So here, the cross-checks become important. Uh, then you might want to remove or record outliers. So there, there may be some data points which are very far from your bulk. And those might require additional analysis. So you might want to record them. And typically, you would leave them out from any sort of statistical uh, quantity that you calculate because they would uh, spoil your majority statistics. But typically what people do is they record the outliers, but they don't include it in the, uh, in the quantitative things that they calculate. Then the third one is to construct analysis. So that is to actually compute what you want to compute or plot trends if you identify them. And this is, of course, related to the aim of your data analysis. So there are three basic types of data analysis related to the aims that we spoke about. So it can be a descriptive statistics where you just talk about the trends that you see or, or report certain quantities like, uh, OK, let me come to that. Then there is exploratory data analysis and confirmatory data analysis. So let's look at what the important things are there. So in exploratory data analysis, you find out trends in the data. Okay. And when you identify these trends, it might help you in cleaning up erroneous data. Or you might it might give you an indication that you need more data. Okay. Uh, and this results in an iterative procedure. So you do a data analysis and you find gaps in your knowledge. So you go and collect more data or you figure out what sort of data is turning out to be wrong and you leave them out. 
then if you're doing descriptive statistics then you just report what you get okay then this is uh, typically not iterative so you just report quantities like mean median mode into quartile range of the data etc uh, or what yeah yeah someone wants to say something no okay uh or your description might involve more domain specific quantities peak position intensity bandwidth velocity whatever you're dealing with okay so whatever quantities you've decided to calculate from your data and then the confirmatory data analysis is related to verifying hypothesis so if your goal was to verify your hypothesis then you do a confirmatory data analysis and see if things fit with your model uh, in all these three cases data visualization plays a very important role okay so data visualization is very very important and you have to learn to do it correctly whatever field you are in and this is related to both uh, accuracy in your presentation presenting all the information necessary for a person who is reading the chart or picture to understand what's going on so if a picture is incomplete in some way it immediately loses value because there is a loose cannon there that you haven't mentioned something so if you plot something and don't mention the units then for a person reading it they will be confused at the very first go so whatever peak you have whatever the trend you have it is not useful anymore so you have to be very very careful when you're visualizing data okay and the other aspect is how human beings perceive uh perceive visual objects so there you can also you can cause a lot of confusion you can also fool people so if you're very smart you might fool people with your data simply by you know changing co a color scheme or uh, doing a different uh, so having some sort of strange axis where you are uh, maybe stretching uh, like using a very large y range so a very bad looking random plot looks like a straight line so so these are these are things you have to be careful about So of course, any uh, experienced scientist will immediately catch you if you try to fool people with these with the elementary sort of uh, tricks. But there are many, many sophisticated tricks like color schemes and uh, 3D plots where you can uh, fool the interpretation. And so you have to be also aware so that you don't get fooled yourself. and since this is something that i think is best presented in a video with people who have the data because i don't have data uh, data to show you exactly uh, so in the last few minutes i will just show you a short video i found it very interesting it's on youtube so you can watch it later as well and i have added links to some other uh, videos as well which you can have a look they're short videos shouldn't be a problem they're very interesting but for in the last few minutes of the class i will just show you this one video okay and then we will end the class can you all hear the uh, audio of this video as well excuse me ma'am but we can't really yeah. hear the video you you cannot hear the video okay um uh, so you 
cannot hear it. So what can I do about that? No, it's actually very soft uh, for some reason. Okay, just hold on. Can you hear me now? You hear the video I'm now? Scientist 
to apply these principles. So three simple principles. The first is choose a human-friendly chart type. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at an example. So we've got some data here from a personality test that I took and my friend took. And we want to compare our results across each of these five major personality dimensions. What do we think the differences are? Quite difficult to do with this pie chart. And we saw earlier with our little experiment that pie charts have some pretty severe limitations. And this is because with a pie chart, we're forced to decode angle and area. And human beings are much better at perceiving numbers that are encoded using simple bars, using simple lengths. So this experiment that I performed on you earlier is very similar to a series of experiments that was performed back in 1984 by two researchers named Cleveland and McGill. And Cleveland and McGill were fascinated by this question of which charts are human beings good at interpreting and which charts do we struggle with? So they showed their participants a series of lines and bars and shapes that encoded numbers. And we call these options up on the screen elementary perceptual tasks. And they measured how good the participants were at deciphering each of these tasks. And they ranked them from the tasks that we're worst at to the tasks that we're best at. And we have some clear winners. Human beings are best at perceiving numbers encoded by length and position. They're our go-to choices for human-friendly chart types. So let's visualize our personality test data using position. Not much of an improvement, right? So this is called a radar chart. And it uses position, but it uses it randomly. There's no reason that these personality dimensions should appear in the particular order they do, or why they should form a pentagon. It pains me to say it, but if you actually take a personality test, you're very likely to see a mess of a chart like this. This chart is becoming popular. Consultants are even using it. So why does this train wreck of a chart proliferate? Well, it could be that the consultants want to distract you from how much they're charging. But it could also be that this chart does look kind of interesting. I have to admit, some people would even use the most dangerous word in the English language when it comes to data visualization to describe this chart. And that word is cool. Whenever I hear this word, whenever someone runs up and tells me, Dom, I've got this cool new chart I want you to see, I shudder in fear because I'm about to see a disgrace of a chart like this. Once again, this chart uses position randomly and it uses area, which we've seen from our pie chart example. It's not a good way to encode numeric values. And we can make it even worse. We can make the bubbles dance around and light up. Modern software packages allow us to do more new and exciting things with data visualization than ever before. But just because we can, doesn't mean we should. So I want to convince you that simpler is better. And I want to come back to a simple human-friendly chart type that uses position. And now we're going to use position properly. We're going to align these positions that show our values on a common scale. We're going to change our data to a dot plot. Suddenly, the insights are immediately obvious. I'm much more extroverted than my friend, and she's much more agreeable. I'm not the most agreeable person. And on the other personality dimensions, we're almost the same, which is maybe why we're friends. I want to move on to the next key to effective data storytelling which is to be a ruthless minimalist. And to explain this concept, I want to use a personal example. So I've been in a relationship for about two years now. And it's often around this time that your partner starts to ask about some of your previous relationships. 
So I did what any good data storyteller would do, and I put together a chart. So here it is. And so, thank you, I'm, I'm going to need your help to fix up this chart. And so I wouldn't, wouldn't blame her if she left me on the spot, just for the bad chart design here. So we're going to fix this up. This chart shows on the x-axis my age and years. And I've estimated the intensity of some of these past relationships over time. But before my audience, which is my current girlfriend, can understand what's going on with this chart and understand my message, we need to remove all these distracting components, which we call chart junk. Let's start with the worst component first, this background color, which serves no purpose. Now, this chart's just an estimate I've put together. We don't need a huge degree of precision. So let's get rid of the grid lines. And we can also get rid of this chart title and simplify our y-axis labels. Now there's one more piece of chart junk that needs to be eliminated from this. Can you spot what it is? I'm gonna go against what we might have learned in school and university and say that every chart does not need a legend. This legend is forcing our audience to do work. Our eyes have to track up and down between the legend and the series labels, and we have to hold the series labels in our short-term memory. It's diverting our attention from the message of the chart. Fortunately, there's a better way. Human beings naturally perceive objects that are close together as belonging together. And we can take advantage of this and just label our series directly by putting the labels close to the series. And we can further reinforce and strengthen this connection by using similarity of color. So let's do that. Now this chart's still a little busy for my liking. We've got a lot of color here. And color is a devastatingly effective way to focus attention in data storytelling. And because it's so effective, we want to use it sparingly. So I'm going to push everything to grey for now to create a blank canvas for storytelling. And that leads us into our third and final key principle of data storytelling, which is that everything we put in front of our audience needs to contribute to a clear key takeaway that our audience cares about. Let's take our audience through a story and highlight them piece of this story one at a time. Yes, are you saying something? Yeah, okay, actually we can stop here if you like because uh, we're already at 12 p.m. And you can maybe listen to the rest of it 